British Proclamation of 1763 granted the area between the Appalachian Mountains and the Mississippi River to Native Americans. Following the Revolution, however, white settlers flooded Native American lands southeast of the Mississippi River, and by the mid-1820s, it was clear that they wouldn't coexist with their Indian neighbors. New treaties promised money, supplies, and protection to tribes that moved west, and a few Cherokee, Creek, and Choctaw accepted the deal. The Seminole and Chickasaw, along with some Choctaw, Creek, and many Cherokee, refused. Instead, while maintaining their cultural beliefs, they reshaped their society towards the Euro-American model, with some establishing plantations and American-styled schools. State legislatures and President Andrew Jackson, who had slaughtered many Southeast Indians during his military career, ignored these efforts. Like many whites, Jackson viewed American Indians as inferior and thought that peaceful coexistence was impossible. Moreover, after the discovery of gold in 1829, Jackson advocated that all land be brought under the control of individual states, even if it belonged to native tribes. He attempted to resolve this predicament in the Indian Removal Act of 1830, in which the government promised to grant tribes land west of the Mississippi River and protection by the U.S. government. The Indian Removal Act stated that the government could negotiate payment in exchange for tribal lands. But when Eastern tribes balked at leaving their homelands, the government resorted to intimidation. Military campaigns such as the Second Seminole War, which lasted from 1835 to 1842, forced more than 100,000 Indians from their land east of the Mississippi River. As tribes moved west, they encroached on the Comanche, the dominant tribe of the Great Plains. The Comanche fought being displaced until 1875, when Chief Quanah Parker surrendered and moved his group to the Fort Seal Reservation in Oklahoma. Georgia spent the 1820s and part of the 1830s trying to force the Cherokee out of the state. The Cherokee, who had achieved a written language and adopted many white American practices, in 1827 declared themselves a constitutional republic and adopted a constitution modeled on the U.S. Constitution. The Cherokee argued that Georgia laws did not have jurisdiction in their territory. In response, state officials abolished the Cherokee government and began taking possession of Cherokee land. Georgia lawmakers determined that the Indian Removal Act meant the Cherokee could be forced to give up any territory in the state. The Cherokee disagreed. In 1831, they went to the Supreme Court in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia. The court sided with Georgia, with Chief Justice John Marshall saying the Cherokee were a domestic, dependent nation of which the United States was guardian. Still, the Cherokees continued to resist relocation. They were aided by Samuel Worcester, a white minister who counseled the Cherokee about their legal rights under the Constitution and various treaties they had signed. Georgia responded by passing a law prohibiting white persons from living with the Cherokee without approval of state authorities, which resulted in Worcester's arrest and four years of imprisonment. To challenge the constitutionality of their imprisonment, Worcester and other missionaries brought their concerns to the Supreme Court in the 1832 case, Worcester versus Georgia. This time, the court ruled against their position in Cherokee Nation versus Georgia, declaring that American Indians were distinct, independent political communities retaining their original natural rights as the undisputed possessors of the soil. Despite the Cherokees' hopes, and in violation of the Supreme Court, Georgia and President Jackson ignored the ruling. In fact, Georgia kept the missionaries in prison until the governor pardoned them in 1833, the same year the U.S. Army began escorting the Cherokee to their new territory. Despite Jackson's refusal to enforce the court's decision, Marshall's ruling on the sovereignty of Indian nations became a rallying point for Native Americans in years to come. Indeed, although Worcester versus Georgia centered on the freedom for missionaries imprisoned because of their assistance to the Cherokee, most tribal members saw the ruling as a sign that they should continue resisting relocation. A smaller group of tribe members, though, felt survival depended on complying with the white man's wishes. 
in defiance of the rest of the tribe, members of this group signed the Treaty of New Echota in 1835, which promised money, livestock, and supplies in exchange for all Cherokee land east of the Mississippi River. Although the majority of the Cherokee opposed the treaty, Georgia and President Jackson used the agreement to justify forcing the tribe off their land. In the summer of 1838, Jackson ordered military troops to remove some 16,000 Cherokee from their homes and place them into internment camps. After a long wait, the first 3,000 Cherokee were put on boats that followed the Tennessee, Ohio, Mississippi, and Arkansas rivers to Indian Territory. The trip took much longer than expected, and many died from exposure and disease, leading those who were still waiting in detention camps to petition to take a two-month trip by land instead. But this trip actually took four months, and the U.S. government had provided few supplies. Weak from their time in the camps, an estimated 4,000 Cherokee died. Suffering from hunger and exposure to the winter weather, and those who survived continued to march under the gunpoints of American soldiers. We now use the term Trail of Tears to describe this hazardous 1,000 mile journey taken by the displaced Cherokee in 1838. But it also refers to the forced relocation of all southeastern Indian tribes from their homelands. The term aptly depicts the misery felt by the individuals who endured the hardships of losing their homes, their land, and their loved ones, and foreshadows the severe trials that would come to tribes residing further west.